This is a reading of August 1974 of For the Love of Vietnam. This is impromptu and may include some mistakes. However, includes also some fascinating facts and memories from my life then. August was a pivotal month politically for America, but a relatively quiet one for us. Life in Saigon was much more confined than the wide open spaces of Taiwan where we had lived for the previous two years. And though birdsy with the pressures of the office, my father did make time to spend with us. Stamp collecting was a favorite activity. And we would pour over mail order catalogs, discuss options, fill out our order forms, and when they arrived, put them in our little tiny stamp books. I can still remember trying to fit in the stamps into the cellophane holders. They wouldn't always fit well, and but I, I made it happen. Now, um, however, politics back home in the U.S., we're in an unprecedented state of disarray. As of this writing, August 1974 holds the inauspicious honor of being the only month in history in which a standing U.S. president left the White House under threat of impeachment. Richard Milhouse Nixon had been elected the 37th president of the United States in 1968 when I was just two years old. He was a vicious politician as well as paranoid and quirky. And he had every conversation in the Oval Office recorded, a practice which proved fatal to his defense against charges that he colluded in the Watergate scandal. The tapes were subpoenaed by the Supreme Court and when released on August 5th of um, 1974, provided compelling evidence that Nixon's complicity in covering up a June 1972 break-in to the Democratic National Committee headquarters by Republicans. With the certainty of impeachment by the Senate on charges of obstruction of justice, abuse of power, criminal cover-up, as well as several violations of the Constitution, Nixon announces resignation, effective at noon on August 9th, 1974. It seems so black and white now. Back then, it really wasn't. For or against Nixon, it was unsettling for the nation. My mother was sick at heart. She wrote home, well, it looks as though Nixon has had it. Even if he is wrong, it still makes one want to weep. Oh, well, what is there to say? While American televisions were tuned into the Watergate trials and Nixon's resignation, the unsuccessful ceasefire was continuing in South Vietnam, creating floods of refugees, many of them orphans, into urban centers across the country. Artillery fire could be heard from Saigon, rounds of 155s, into Viet Cong held territory, just a hair's breadth from our house, our home in the city. My little brother Jimmy said one of his only memories of being six in Saigon was watching rosy bursts of artillery from the roof of our house of an evening. I didn't know what it was, he said, but I didn't think it was good. Imagine a six year old burst of artillery. The police and the, the uh, peace and ceasefire in Vietnam are curious, wrote my father to his sister in August. Da Nang is hit with five dead yesterday and the general level of fighting kicked off by the North Vietnamese is rising daily. Most people may be thinking of Watergate, Nixon, inflation and gas prices, but it, war is very close and very real to us here. The South Vietnamese were particularly vulnerable to the outcome of the political turmoil in Washington. It wasn't just a philosophical matter of who was going to take office, but what politics the new president was going to adhere to in light of the Vietnam question. The slightest change in the winds could spell disaster. Despite the mounting evidence to the contrary, my father was holding on to his conviction that his efforts would be successful. He wrote, sometimes the best moments are the darkest ones. As Churchill told us, I still have faith that we will win. And remember, there was a ceasefire on. Theoretically, the war was over, but he was saying that the South Vietnamese, when I was young, I used to say South Vietnamese, South Vietnamese would um, be successful in holding on to their portion of the country. My father's optimism in retrospect was not well-placed, nor broadly felt among the South Vietnamese populace. 
Nixon's recognition initiated its own domino effect that would not stop until the Americans were run out of Saigon. The citizens of South Vietnam seemed to know this instinctively. Within hours of Nixon's resignation, rumors of ill omen put Saigon on the sweat. A boulder sitting atop a hill above President Thieu's native village had inexplicably cracked in two. Soothsayer said, could not help but cast this incident in a dark pallor, a foreshadowing that the worst was yet to come. Oblivious to such signs, the whitewash of American politics rolled on. Gerald Rudolph Ford, Ford sworn in on August 9th, 1974, concurrently with Nixon's resignation, immediately expressed intentions to carry out the policy of his predecessor in regards to South Vietnam. He sent a letter to South Vietnamese President Tiu on August 10th, reassuring him of continued support. Tiu proudly read the letter to his cabinet. They thought that, well, even if Nixon had resigned, they could still believe in a commitment from the U.S. to help South Vietnam, Bu, Bu Den, the, the Vietnamese ambassador at large, said later. What they didn't know, however, was that President Ford had sent letter, letters to several countries on that same day, assuring all of them of continued support. But they were just letters. They weren't acts of Congress. Before long, senior congressional leaders would inform Ford and his Secretary of State Kissinger that Vietnam was just one of many urgent needs. The oil crisis and a struggling domestic economy loomed larger than the needs of a flagging Asian army half a world away, especially in a country that caused so many Americans such, dis um, such dissension and heartache. With as many congressmen face with so many congressmen facing re-election pressures, the unpopular and divisive subject of Vietnam was not going to be brought up willingly, and or if at all, that message was not really to Tiu and his cabinet. They were allowed to believe that the fate of Vietnam was still near and dear to the Americans' heart. While there had been issues um, pressing in on the powers that be, we as a family simply carried on settling into new life in Saigon. Home renovations were continuing. We finally had lights and air conditioning on all three floors and a working telephone and a bona fide, if tiny swimming pool in the center of the house. One thing we still didn't have was a washer and dryer. So we've been there two months, no washer and dryer, if you can imagine. Um, by the way, there were seven kids and two adults. So that's a family of nine. It makes me sick, my mother wrote. The maids sit and scrub the clothes on the tile floor. They are the clothes destroyers in action. So that was August, 1974. We also had a housewarming party, which I wrote about in a flash memoir. It is included in another video in my Vietnam collection on YouTube. And if you're in my Substack, it's also included in this article. Thanks for listening. Thanks for reading. Do take care. I'll see you next time.